This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I am Amy Goodman. Today, we remember Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg, who died June 16th at the age of 92, just months after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. In December 2017, Dan Ellsberg joined us to talk about his book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. The book is based in part on his role drafting the nuclear war plans for Defense Secretary Robert McNamara in 1961, while John F. Kennedy was president. So you made copies of top-secret reports for plans about nuclear war years before you copied the Pentagon Papers right. and released them to the press? Essentially, my notes and sometimes verbatim excerpts, not the entire plans themselves, <clears throat> but on plans that were then unknown to the president, to begin with, to President Kennedy. I briefed his aide, McGeorge Bundy, in his first month in office on the nature of the plans and some of the other problems, like the delegation of authority to theater commanders for nuclear war by President Eisenhower, which was fairly shocking to uh, McGeorge Bundy, even though Kennedy chose to renew that delegation, as other presidents have. But I was given the job of uh, improving the Eisenhower plans, which was not a very high bar, actually, at that time, because they were, on their face, the worst plans in the history of warfare. A number of people who saw them, but very few civilians ever got a look at them. In fact, the Joint Chiefs couldn't really get the targets out of General LeMay at the Strategic Air Command. And there was a good reason for that. They were insane. Uh, they called for first strike plans, which was by order of President Eisenhower. He didn't want any plan for limited war of any kind with the Soviet Union under any circumstances, because that would enable the army to ask for enormous numbers of divisions or even tactical nuclear weapons to deal with the Soviets. So he required that the only plan for fighting Soviets under any circumstances, such as an encounter in the Berlin Corridor, the access to West Berlin, or over Iran, which was already uh, a flashpoint at that point, or Yugoslavia, if they'd gone in. However the war started, uh, with an uprising in East Germany, for example, however it got started, Eisenhower's directed plan was for all-out war in a first initiation of nuclear war, assuming the Soviets had not used nuclear weapons. And that plan called, in our first strike, for hitting every city, actually every town, over 25,000, in the USSR, and every city in China, a war with Russia would inevitably involve immediate attacks on every city in China. And in the course of doing this, <coughs> pardon, there were no reserves. Everything was to be thrown as soon as it was available. It was a vast trucking operation of thermonuclear weapons over to the USSR, but not only the USSR. The captive nations, the East Europe satellites in the Warsaw Pact, were to be hit in their air defenses, which were all near cities, their transport points, their communications of any kind. So they were, BT, uh, they were to be annihilated as well. Uh, I couldn't believe, when I saw these, that the Joint Chiefs actually had ever calculated how many people they would actually kill in this course. In fact, colonels who were friends of mine in the air staff told me they'd never seen an actual figure for the uh, total casualties. Uh, we had exact figures of the number of targets and uh, how many planes would be needed and every sort of thing, many calculations, but not victims. So I drafted a question which the aide to McGeorge Bundy, Bob Comer, sent to the Joint Chiefs in the name of the president. And the question was, in the event of your carrying out your general nuclear war plans, which were first strike plans, how many will die, first I asked, in the USSR and China alone? In the thought that, by the way, they'd be embarrassed to discover, to say, we have to have more time. We've never really calculated that. I was wrong, uh, and my friends were wrong in the Air Force. They came back with an answer very quickly. 325 million people in the USSR and China alone. Well, <clears throat> then I asked, all right, how many altogether? And a few days later, a hundred million in East Europe, the captive nations, another hundred million in West Europe, our allies, from our own strikes, by fallout, depending on which way the wind blew. And however the wind blew, a third hundred million in 
adjoining countries, neutral countries like Austria and Finland or Afghanistan then, Japan, northern India and so forth, a total of 600 million people. That was a time, by the way, when the population of the world was 3 billion. And that was an underestimate of their casualties, 100 holocausts. It was very clear that uh, they hadn't included, I hadn't asked actually, what would Russian retaliation be against us and against West Europe. Uh, they were thought at that time, wrongly, to have hundreds of weapons against the U.S., but they did have hundreds of weapons against West Europe. There's no question West Europe would go under any circumstances. If we were defending West Europe, Germany, for example, we were planning to destroy the continent in order to save it. 600 million, that was 100 holocausts. And when I held the piece of paper in my hand that had that figure, that they'd sent out unembarrassedly, you know, proudly to the president, here's what we will do, I thought, this is the most evil plan that has ever existed. It's insane. The weapons, the machinery that will carry this out, this is no hypothetical plan like Herman Kahn might have uh, conceived at the doomsday machine that he thought up at the Rand Corporation as my colleague. This was an actual war plan for how we would use the existing weapons, so many of which I'd seen already that well, time. Well, uh, Dan Ellsberg, the colossal carnage that they were envisioning uh, as a result of, the, of this uh, first strike uh, use was uh, doubly, made doubly worse, as you reveal, by the fact that the image that we have, that the president is the one who, who holds the, key, the switch or, or has his hand on the button, it's not true, that there were that many people have the capacity to initiate a nuclear war. If you could talk about uh, that as well. To start with, even if it were only the president, no one man, really no one nation, should have the ability, the ability even, to threaten or to carry out a hundred holocausts at his will. That machinery should never have existed, and it does exist right now, and every president has had that power, and this president does have that power. But the recent discussions of that, which emphasize his sole authority to do that, don't take account of the fact that he has authority to delegate. And he has delegated. Every president has delegated. I don't know the details of what President Trump has done or since the Cold War. Every president in the Cold War, right through uh, Carter and Reagan, had delegated, in fact, to theater commanders in case communications were cut off. That means that the idea that the president is the only one with sole power to issue an order that will be recognized as an authentic, authorized order is totally false. How many fingers are on buttons? Probably no president has ever really known the details of that. I knew in 61, for example, that Admiral Harry D. Felt in Sink Pack's Commander-in-Chief Pacific, for whom I worked as a researcher, had delegated that to 7th Fleet, down to various commanders, and they in turn had delegated down to people. So when you say how many altogether feel authorized if their communications are cut off, and that happened part of every day in the Pacific when I was there. Communications got better, but the delegations never changed. Uh, there's a, it's, we've never allowed it to be possible that an enemy could paralyze our retaliation by hitting our president or our command and control, and neither did the Russians. Uh, when President Carter and then President Reagan advertised the fact that they, their plans emphasized decapitation hitting Moscow above all, which the French and British always plan to do, by the way, with their smaller forces. Uh, and when that became clear, the Russians instituted what they called a dead hand, a perimeter system in Russian, which assured that if Moscow was destroyed, other commanders would have the power and would be told to launch their strikes. There was even a plan to do that automatically by computer, as a number of our military always recommended to make the whole thing computerized, as in the doomsday machine of Herman Kahn and Stanley Kubrick. But generally, they allow for lower-level majors, colonels, to decide the time has come, we've lost our commanders, the time has come to go. That's almost certainly true in North Korea right now. Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg speaking on Democracy Now! in December 2017 about his book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. 
Two years later, in 2019, I spoke to Dan Ellsberg a day after the Justice Department charged WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange with 17 counts of violating the Espionage Act for publishing U.S. military and diplomatic documents exposing U.S. war crimes. Assange is locked up in the Belmarsh Prison in London. He faces up to 175 years in prison if extradited and convicted in the United States. Yesterday is a day that will be live in the history of journalism, of law in this country, and of civil liberties uh, in this country, because it was a direct attack on the First Amendment, an unprecedented one. There hasn't actually been such a significant attack on the freedom of the press and the First Amendment, which is the bedrock of our republic, really, our form of government, since my case in 1971, 48 years ago. But this is uh, I was indicted as a source. And I warned newsmen then that that would not be the last indictment of a source if I were convicted. Well, I wasn't convicted. The, the charges were dropped on governmental misconduct, and it was another 10 years before anybody else faced that charge under the Espionage Act again, Samuel Loring Morrison. <clears throat> and it was uh, not until President Obama that nine cases were brought, as I'd been warning for so long. But my warning really was that it wasn't going to stop there. Almost inevitably, there would be a stronger attack directly on the foundations of journalism against editors, publishers, and journalists themselves. And we've now seen that as of yesterday. That's a new front in President uh, Trump's war on the free press, which he regards as the enemy of the people. And the Trump administration saying Julian Assange is not a publisher, is not a journalist, that's why he is not protected by the First Amendment. In the face of this new indictment, uh, which, and let me correct something that's been uh, said just a little wrong uh, by everybody so far, he doesn't just face 170 years. That's for the 70, uh, 17 counts on the Espionage Act, each worth 10. Plus, he's still facing the five-year conspiracy charge that he started out with a few weeks ago. Uh, I was sure that the administration did not want to keep Julian Assange in jail just for five years. So I've been expecting these Espionage Act charges. Uh, I really expected them later, after he was extradited, because adding them now makes it a little more complicated for Britain to extradite him now, as I understand it. Uh, they're not supposed to extradite for political offenses or for political motives, and this is obviously for both political motives and political offenses. So from Julian Assange's point of view, it makes extradition a little more difficult. Why, then, did they bring it right now? Well, coming back to the, uh, to the case, by the way, that I faced, I faced only 11 uh, Felony Act charges, each worth 10 years in prison, plus a conspiracy charge worth five. So I was facing exactly 115 years in prison. He's facing exactly 175. Now, that's not a difference that makes any difference. In both cases, it's a question of a life sentence. I think that the reason they brought these charges so soon, uh, because they had until June 12th, uh, was to lay out, the necessity to lay out for extradition all the charges they planned to bring. And I don't assume these are the last ones. They've got a couple of weeks left to string up some new charges. They started out with a charge that made Julian look something other than a normal journalist. Uh, the help to hacking a password sounded like something that, even in the digital age, perhaps most journalists wouldn't do, and that would uh, hope to separate him from the support of other journalists. In this case, when they had to lay out their larger charge, this is straight journalism. Uh, they mentioned, for instance, that he solicited in, uh, in, uh, investigative material. He solicited classified information terribly. He didn't just passively receive it over the transom. I can't count the number of times I've been solicited for classified information, starting with the Pentagon Papers, but long after that. And that's by every member of the responsible press that I dealt with, The Times, The Post, AP, uh, you name it. That's journalism. So what they have done is recognizable, I think, this time to all journalists uh, that they are in the crosshairs of this one. They may not have known enough about digital uh, performance to help a source conceal her identity by using new passwords, as uh, Julian was charged with. They may not be able to do that, but every one of them has 
eagerly received classified information and solicited it. So uh, every journalist, and not only in this country, and not only at the federal level, already uh, Brian Carmody in San Francisco has had his house broken into with sledgehammers to get all his material, uh, looking for his source in a uh, local dispute. Uh, Daniel Hale, the NSA, has, uh, has been brought. I think that President Trump has, in effect, opened the doors to these kinds of constitutions in state and country jurisdictions, state and county, I meant to say, jurisdictions, and undoubtedly in other countries as well that may not have a First Amendment but have looking to some precedent for the United States. That's what it's, what it's able to do. So there's a full-scale multi-front war going on, not only in this country, and President Trump is leading the way. We end our show with Daniel Ellsberg in his own words, May 18th, 2018, when I spoke to him at a Right Livelihood Laureate gathering at University of California, Santa Cruz. I asked him what message he had for government insiders who are considering becoming whistleblowers. My message to them is, don't do what I did. Don't wait till the bombs are actually falling or thousands more have died before you do what I wish I'd done years earlier in 64 or even 61 on the nuclear issue, and that is reveal the truth that you know, the dangerous truths uh, that are being withheld by the government at whatever cost to yourself, whatever risk that may take. Consider doing that because a war's worth of lives may be at stake. Or in the case of the two existential crises I'm talking about, the future of humanity is at stake. So many graduating classes, I think, have been talked, uh, have been told uh, year after year for half a century that they face a crossroads or that uh, much depends on what they do. That's no exaggeration right now. It's this generation, not the next one, that the people living right now that have to change these problems fast. And I think truth-telling is crucial to mobilize that. What is the information that you think most needs to be revealed right now? Well, I'm certain that there are studies in the Pentagon and CIA and the NSC right now that reveal two things that would be disastrous, catastrophic to go to war against North Korea, uh, even though the immediate casualties would be measured in millions rather than billions, which is the nuclear winter problem. And likewise, it would be catastrophic to be at war with Iran, uh, an, a nation four times the size and population of Iraq. And as I say, we've never faced up to the human cost of that war, Iraq. So I'm sure there are studies top secret, secret, confidential, or higher than top secret that make this very clear. I would say that Mattis, uh, John Mattis, the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, should not wait until the bombs are falling before he reveals those truths to Congress and the public. And if he doesn't do it, and he's very unlikely to do it, then his secretary or his aides or assistant secretaries should risk, sacrifice their careers to avert these wars, which must not happen. Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg died June 16th at the age of 92 just months after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Our deepest condolences to his family, his wife Patricia, his children Robert, Mary, and Michael, his grandchildren, and his great-granddaughter. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.